Welcome to Creative Distillation, where we distill entrepreneurship research into actionable insights. I am your host, Jeff York, Research Director at the Deming Center for Entrepreneurship at the Leeds School of Business at the University of Colorado Boulder. Coming to you live this week with my co-host, as always. Well, actually, we're not live at all. That's not that is a total <laughs> lie. We are a we're live. live right now. We are live. I guess it's, it's just my excitement got the best of me because we're doing our first podcast from on location in Boulder since the pandemic ended. Brad, it is wonderful to be here. My co-host here, as always, Brad Werner. Yep. And so I am Brad Werner. I am the faculty director for entrepreneurship at the Deming Center uh, at the University of Colorado Leeds School of Business. But more importantly, and I'm an entrepreneur. And even more importantly than that, Jeff, being uh, live here, but being in the distillery with our new friend, Alistair from Boulder Spirits is really, really exciting. Uh, I walked in, I was in a really... <laughs> mood over here. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just waiting for the first pour. Yeah. So, so Brad's quote was, you know, with the day I'm having going somewhere where I can have a drink, that's just really, you know, that's perfect for today. I was like, as opposed to other days, Brad. So, uh, yeah. but uh, no, this is awesome. We're in, we're in this building called Vapor Distilling. We'll learn more about that, but we're here to learn about Boulder Spirits with our guests this month or this week or whatever time lapse is. But again, I just want to focus for just a second on this, like for... Good God, how long has it been? A year and a half yeah. since we did one of these, like, on location? I mean, it's it's unbelievable. I think just even the energy I'm feeling already is a big difference, right? I'm sick of looking at both of you guys through Zoom, okay? <laughs> right? Uh, this, this. <laughs> that made a lovely move because we're here with Alistair Brogan. Oh, yeah. Uh, Alistair, welcome. Thank you. Thanks uh, for having me. Oh, uh, it's wonderful. So, Alistair, I, I, I would describe your role. We know that you are the proprietor and owner of Boulder Spirits, but you're also the distiller, correct? Uh, Part-time. Okay. part-time we've got th two other distillers here we've got graham who actually is also scottish and then we've got justin as well so i'm more now going from the distilling into more trying to sell the product right making it you could say is maybe the easier part yeah the harder part is then selling it and selling more of it sure sure well, this is a beautiful location i mean if, i wish folks could see us we're like surrounded by barrels and and bags of this uh, is the, the coolest, and, uh, coolest spot we've ever actually sat right we have fold-out tables amongst casks just <laughs> i mean piled four and five high this is really really incredible yeah. and really a creative space well, I knew Brad was going to be like a kid in a candy shop when we got here. So, so Alistair, um, maybe we should just have a drink straight up because, I mean, we've been looking at these beautiful bottles and learning about this stuff. So maybe we should taste something just right away so that because otherwise Brad's going to get very antsy like you. Know. OK, well, well, we'll just launch straight into it. So here is an American single malt whiskey. All okay. right, so already this oh, is interesting. You, an American, you, you were telling us earlier, there's a huge difference between an American single malt whiskey and what people commonly call scotch. Yeah, I, I mean, a single malt whiskey throughout the world is going to be incredibly different no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole host of reasons for that. It can be the climate, it can be the water they use, it can be the still that you use, the grain, the yeast. Really, every single country and every single area is uniquely different. Scotch is scotch because like champagne is champagne but that doesn't mean that uh, they necessarily have the best mm. they have a high quality spirit but you know the japanese the taiwanese yeah. the germans and hopefully now the americans are now doing it as good as anywhere around the world would right? you say that america's there yet no america's got a long way to go here's the thing uh the tax and trade bureau are hopefully this year going to give us what's classed as standard of identity because at the moment Believe it or not, American single malt whiskey is not a category. It's malt whiskey. So when you go into the liquor store, when you see malt whiskey, 51% malted barley, and then some other grain, whereas it's not a category here yet, it's mm. going to be. There's 150 distilleries throughout the US petitioning the Tax and Trade Bureau. It's going to happen because mm. guess what? The big guys, the Pernod Ricards, the Diageos, they are pumping a lot of money to get this as a recognized category because they know that there are some phenomenal single malt whiskeys in the u.s well yeah i mean what we're tasting right now is one of them this, this is, is fantastic it's, it's just so smooth wow i yeah i'm amazed actually there are even in colorado single malt whiskeys and each one of them is unique every mm. one of them tastes very differently right and it's just like scotch whiskey you know you can have distilleries literally next door to each other and they're making dramatically different single malt whiskeys, mm. but they have a market for each of them. So you said this is just a, what we would call, I don't know if I'm using the right terminology, yeah. uh, not straight whiskey, because that's young. Uh, 
straight whiskey is in the US when you put the word straight it means it's been two years in the barrel right and really that's one of the few designations that you can have other than putting an age statement you have bottled and bond which we'll talk about later uh, when you taste I saw that. you had one of those right? yeah but straight is a two years and a lot okay. of whiskies uh, especially bourbons and uh, ryes they're out two years almost on the day because they're big heavy grains yeah. that maybe doesn't require that length of time Malted barley is more delicate, a lot of depth and complexity. So none of our whiskies come out before three years. Okay. But remember, they go into new oak barrels, and that's the big, big difference. As, right. As opposed to most of the world use ex-bourbon barrels. Now, see, this is fascinating to me because, like, okay, you're going to have to educate me here. But my understanding, bourbon is designated. I've seen people use the label bourbon. They're not supposed to unless it's distilled and aged in Kentucky, correct? Wrong. Wrong, yeah, so there you go. I love this, I yeah. love this, because uh, people from Kentucky will say this. Now, yes, yes, that's the way I heard it. Exactly. I was just in Kentucky and they told <laughs> exactly. me this. Exactly, people from Kentucky really- They also think, gave me a huge glass of bourbon to drink, so when, I listened when to When Kentucky them, started <laughs> making bourbon, so was half America making bourbon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they've never got that designation. To get that designation- It's not a real designation. Uh, not really. That's where a lot of the bourbon uh, comes from, Yeah. but there's, as good and some spectacular bourbons outside. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, well our favorites is from up in Fort Collins. Like, oh, you know, yeah. Right? So, and you make bourbon as well. Yeah, we do. We do. A, well, we do a single malt whiskey. We do a range of single malt whiskeys, but also we do three bourbons. But bourbons with a difference. And uh, the, the drink of America is still bourbon. Yeah. Uh, single malt whiskey is starting to, to, to edge into that. But the whole history of farming and uh, alcohol has been around corn mm. so bourbon yeah corn 51 corn most bourbons yeah 70 80 percent corn yeah corn and rye are the yeah. main ingredients for most american whiskeys right big flavors big tastes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, but this is what this is where i was I mean, we were talking about this earlier i just think it's fascinating so i think most americans when they think about scottish single malt whiskey they think about scotch they're like oh that goes so far back that's like an ancient beverage right. uh -huh. and bourbon is like a newer thing like you know a new american thing but you're telling me that most of the scotch whiskey what we think of as scotch is actually aged in bourbon barrels most of it is aged in bourbon barrels because the scots when there were the sherry and port and the wine barrels weren't coming across in the same numbers mm. as the single malt whiskey distilleries were, were using and needed they ah. looked to america where they just introduced the, the law that had to be first use barrels ah, and yes. then when they finished with them they would literally dump them they, yeah there was nothing a to market do. was created so a market was created by the scots then bringing them across yeah but it gives you a different type of whiskey yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I, and i joke to some of my friends you got to remember is that all scotch whiskey sorry a lot of scotch whiskey because they don't all use ex-bourbon barrels some of them start and finish in wine barrels certain you know uh, sherry or port barrels yeah so they'll start and finish their life in that, but the most of them are ex bourbon barrels. Yeah. And with all that bourbon that sits in the wood that gets transported, all Scotch whiskey has a most Scotch whiskey has a level of bourbon infused, <laughs> which is really I find quite I don't don't talk about that to the Scots. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm Here, here's a question I have, and I wish up. I could I wish people could see what we're looking at. So I'm looking over Alistair's uh, shoulder, and I see seven different bottles on the table, opened and ready to pour. Now. I had businesses in the wine country, and there was always a certain progression for wines. Does that go the same way when we're doing a, a whiskey tasting? Yes. Now, what I try and do with the whiskey tasting is either have a progression so that the flavors build, mm. or alternatively, in all the, the tours that I do, and we do here, we try and give contrasts. So the contrast between a, a single malt whiskey, 100% malted barley, mm -hmm. and a bourbon that has uh, 51 corn. And I like to sort of show people that difference between them. I haven't decided yet what I'm going to do with you guys, but uh, <laughs> you know, I like to see those. Our next these, I like those contrasts between them because most of what we have here, especially in the single malt whiskies, is th their expressions. There's there's an added layer. So whether it be port cask finish, sherry cask finish, we've even got a peated single malt whiskey here, bottled in bond, which just is a bit of a more of a progression in the age mm -hmm. and the the ABV. So I just like to give those uh, sort of contrast between each one. 
I have to tell you, folks, if you're ever in bourbon, or ever in bourbon, <laughs> I'm in bourbon, I'm in bourbon heaven. Um, if you're ever in Boulder, Vapor Distillery and Boulder Spirits is a hidden gem. Um, yeah, I would fantastic. highly recommend coming here. I don't say that much, but I really <laughs> think that this is cool. Introduce yourself to Alistair, have him talk you through it, because yeah. uh, you can tell the passion that's in his uh, in his blood, too. So this is just really awesome. And they can, they can find you on the web under under Boulder Spirits or Vapor Distillery or Vapor if they Distillery. want to come yes, visit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, know, I know that's how I found it. It's, it's sort of tucked away in a little corner here at Boulder. Yeah. We were talking about that earlier. Uh, <laughs> don't trust Google. But yeah, well, no, <laughs> when you look, when you go with Google, you're going to get to a parking lot, drive out of that parking lot and drive east, and you'll see a massive sign like the size of a billboard that says Vapor Distillery, and you'll feel like an idiot just like I did because I couldn't find it. That's right. But, but seriously, they've got a fantastic bar, yep. uh, tasting room. This place just, I mean, it just yep. the love of the craft that permeates it. it is palpable. You can feel it here. So, well, well, what else should we try? So, okay, so we had our single malt whiskey, uh, 100% malted barley. What I now do, no, I've made my decision. Okay. I'm going to flip now from the single malt whiskey to our bourbon. Oh, okay. Now, the bourbon, we do something a little different here with our bourbon. Most bourbons, as I was saying earlier, uh, 70% corn, heat and sweet. Uh, yeah. 20% rye, earthy and spicy. Yeah. And maybe 5% malted barley. Most American distilleries use malted barley in very small quantities, normally single figures. What we wanted to do was bring malted barley in as an actual taste profile to the bourbon. So calm that heat and sweet down, yeah. which being European, you know, we struggle with that real intense heat and sweet. Yeah. Cool it down, but add another profile to it. Hmm. So malted barley. And, you know, sadly, when I ask a lot of really sort of eminent uh, bourbon makers why they don't use malted barley as a flavoring, uh, I get the same answers I get from the Scotch whiskey distilleries when I ask them a question. And the answer is normally, sadly, that's the way we've always done it. Oh, really? <laughs> so it's not really, that's not an answer. Gosh, um, I thought it was going to be money because I, I, I was just thinking it's... corn's cheap. Like, I mean, that's, uh, but, I mean, I well, there's, there's still a lot of green distilleries in Europe. So yeah. they are making the corns and the ryes and blending it. Mm. Um, yeah, sure, sure. But, you know, the, the, the great thing about, you know, Colorado's 100 distilleries, the U.S. 2,200 craft distilleries, is that we've got that ability to play and mess around and we can come up with some great creations. Now, yeah. I hasten to add, some of those great creations are not very commercial. Yeah. Uh, so you do have to try and wind your way back to something that is going to appeal to um, the commercial side. Mm. But this bourbon is our number one seller. Oh, it is. Uh, oh, it is. Because, you know, at the end of the day, Americans are still bourbon lovers until I managed to change their minds. Uh, uh, but they're still bourbon lovers it's still our number one it's a go-to for a lot of people but for me this is just calm that heat and sweet and add yeah. a little bit of more another layer of complexity it doesn't have the the almost cloying front-end sweetness that you get in like a, I don't know I'm just Elijah Craig or whatever you know bourbon maker's mark they, they stay yeah. on bourbons or Again, the American palate tends to lean towards that sweeter yeah. side of it. This is not um, this much. And this is, and corn really accentuates the sweetness yeah. that's coming out from, from the, the, the grain and also the barrel. So, yes, you're right. It's a little bit less sweet. The sweetness you're getting is A, from the corn, but also B, from that caramelization of the sugars in, in the barrel. Right, right. The other thing that I would say is, first of all, it's very, very smooth. And yeah. there are many American bourbons that taste great. It, but then they die in your mouth. And this is not dying. Is that, I, Jeff has been a beer judge. Um, I'm just a drinker. <laughs> <That's not true. laughs> you're very, you, but you, you're, 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 you're nail on the head there. Yeah. What you're trying for is you're trying to get mouthfeel, number one, mm -hmm. but you're also looking for it to stay on the palate for a long time. When I think of beer, sadly, I think of you take a sip, it's gone, and you've got to take another sip two seconds later. What we try and achieve, all whiskey makers try and achieve, is you take a sip, you sit there, you enjoy it, it stays with you mm -hmm, for a yeah. while, and then it's maybe 30 seconds between the sips rather than yeah. five seconds. Wow, which is good. So, yeah, and that's what we try and achieve. Uh, yes, mouthfeel, great. Our bourbon, yes, stays there, but some of the other whiskeys we've got, I feel stay for even longer. Okay. Uh, and, and it really sort of... Malted barley, I think, stays a bit longer than bourbons. Or, yeah, okay. Or, or I mean, it's almost, it does some... Are you feeling that, though, Jeff? Are you... No, no, no. It definitely lingers. Like, I mean, and, and I'm almost getting like a... 
I get like almost like a weedy kind of flavor on the background a little bit. I don't know. That's just what mm-hmm. I'm tasting. I, I mean, it's it's really nice. It is very nice. So tell us a little bit about the background of the business. Yeah, like, how did you even get into how, how distilling? Did, how did uh, a Scotsman come to be making American single malt whiskey here in Boulder, Colorado? Oh, long story. But um, I think the first point was, and one of the reasons I'm here is my wife's American. Ah. And I took her back to Scotland. Uh, she suffered a lot with the rain and the snow and the, <laughs> the dampness. And I sold my business in 2009. And Was it a liquor business? No, it was actually a, a fuel distribution business okay. ah. and fuel car processing. Mm-hmm. And sold it unexpectedly in 2009, made the decision to come to the US. I needed to have a job, needed to have a <laughs> hobby. My hobby was going to be distilling. But very quickly, I realized, because I bought such a big uh, Forsyth's Copper Pot still, that it was going to be, it was going to take over my life. Is this the one we saw earlier? Yeah. yeah. You I bought mean, that for your hobby? I, I, bought, I bought that for my hobby. And uh, oh, only a few more. Look online for the now, picture. You are living the American dream, There's though, a picture right? Of it. Oh, you work your butt That's off, it. you sell your yeah. business, and then you go and you distill something. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, so I really wanted to do this as a hobby, but I got involved with... Uh, before Vapor Distillery was, was whiskey, it was a gin company. Oh, okay. So I got involved with a great guy, Ted Palmer, who's more of a brewer, but he loved the he distilled gin. But I really wanted to lay down my barrels of whiskey. Yeah. Did that for four or five years. Uh, worked with the company, then bought the company out uh, to progress with the whiskey. Ah. So the whiskey only really came out two, two years ago. Ah, oh, okay. And that really is the future of, yeah. of, of this business because... Here's the thing: vodkas and gins, yeah. liqueurs. They're a dime a dozen. Uh, I mean, exactly. Can make e- those. Every every state has twenty or thirty of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Uh, so whiskey is, is a unique, and I was able to put uh, my real stamp on it. But but you just right. mentioned that there's a hundred distilleries in Colorado. So how do you get known? How do you make a difference? What is your differentiation between the, the rest of the rest of your peers? Well, with the hundred, uh, I would say that maybe only about fifteen, twenty of us are doing a whiskey. Okay. Uh, that has got an aged whiskey that's coming out. We are different because we are doing a single malt whiskey. We're different because of our high malted barley content. And amongst the whiskey people of Colorado, I am pretty, I'm, I'm not going to say surprised, but pretty pleased at how, how knowledgeable that they are. And especially amongst the craft drinkers, which, you know, US wide is only 3% of the co- consumers. Right. They really know their whiskeys. And the liquor stores even more. The liquor stores, we do a lot of single barrel sales into the liquor stores. And I tell you, these guys know their stuff. They come up here, we'll pick barrels, they'll assess what proof they want, they'll assess which what they want, and then they then sell and promote it in their liquor stores. So is this like Hazel's? Uh, Hazel's, Argonaut. There's probably about 30 liquor stores in Colorado that will do their own single barrel selections. And, you know, we're selling barrels as... As far as in Nebraska and Canada, really full barrels. A fourth one is just about to go to Nebraska, yeah. to whiskey clubs, to to Florida. You know, we're selling a lot of individual barrels that have been selected by people, uh, single barrel selections, and people are pretty knowledgeable. You know, my son is getting married in October. Maybe yeah. we should do something. Absolutely. There we go. You know what? Though I have to agree with you. So if you don't know Hazel's, Hazel's is a warehouse of liquor. Um, <laughs> but when I browse the whiskey bourbon aisles. The people that are working there really know what the hell yeah, they're talking they about. And they're, they've got to be your best salesman. They, they are. And, you know, we were selling through uh, a lot of whiskey in certain stores and not so much. But if you educate the salespeople on the floor and they become a fan of yours, then it really takes off. Yeah. And there are, there's probably, I think there's 1,200 liquor stores in Colorado. And there's a percentage of them that, and we all know who they are, really focus on that education yeah. of their salespeople, and I think yeah. that's vital. Sadly, you go back to the UK, and no matter yeah. where you go, education of the salespeople is not a priority. Yeah, no, it's. I, I think that's true of like any business where you're selling like a craft product that's differentiated. I mean, I know I've seen people that were selling, even for example, like um, organic sunscreen. Like, so I had a friend. I mean, I know that seems awfully far afield from what we're talking about, but the same thing she was saying. Like, look, now the best thing I can do is to have someone in the store be able to explain to someone why they would want to pay the extra for my product. Yeah, and that's the same in the marijuana business. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I mean, it's a, it's just, it's a really great way. So are you making whiskeys for yourself knowing that you have a palate that resonates? Or are you talking to customers and talking to these folks that are knowledgeable and they're discussing a uh, flavor profile that you develop for them? That's a tough one because 
there is a little bit of you're making it for yourself, yeah. but also in the back of your head, you know what's commercial and what's not sure. commercial. Yeah. Sure. Because every single person has a different opinion on things. Whether, I mean, we just, we're just selling an amazing amount of single malt whiskey to Canada because they're big single malt whiskey lovers. Huh. Whereas in some states, they're not. So it really is state by state and also country by country. Yeah. And it's difficult. It's really how your gut feels and what you want to do. Mm. So having the 44 malted barley was a massive risk because when it comes off the still, you still don't know what it's going to be like after three, four years in the barrel. Yeah, but you crazy. could tell, right, a little bit. Can you tell if it's a failure? You can tell whether there's anything off. Okay. So you can tell yeah. if there's off flavors, off smells, you can tell that. But at the end of the day, we were the first to do this. As a lot of craft distilleries are first to do their own thing, and it is a wee bit of a risky thing. So, no. yeah, you, you have confidence in what you're doing. You know, what we're making, no. For example, I only know one other person in the US that's making a peated single malt whiskey. Yeah. That's standard in the rest of the world, but not in yeah. the US. Huh. Port cask, sherry cask. Yeah. All those things are not standard here. So it's a little bit of an education. Yeah. So I'll let bourbon keep the lights on. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sure. Yeah. The single malt whiskey. <laughs> yeah, no. Happy Van Winkle's rolling over in his grave. <laughs> uh, I think it's fascinating. I think a lot of the, the craft breweries have gone down the same path of like, like, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna sell, you know, I think uh, every craft brewer I know is sick of making hazy IPA at this point. <laughs> like, I don't want to make freaking hazy IPA. I really don't care about that. But for whatever reason, that became the trendy thing. And that's what people drink. So they'll make that and then they'll make their sours and their more complex beers. Yeah. And here's the thing with, a, I think for a lot of people, when we do tastings, etc., I always say to people, listen, guys, you know what's in it. You know what grains and what flavors grains might give you. You know what the barrel will give you, but I'm not here to tell you what you're going to taste. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of people have a very, very different yes. uh, yeah. perception of it. We're not, we're not the wine guys. You know, you, you can decide in the power of suggestion, if I screamed peanut butter, everybody would suddenly uh, sorry, taste peanut butter in it. Or if I said, I was just oh, going to say, this one really yeah. has a peanut butter. <laughs> or if I said, uh, whatever. So, you know, I'm very, very conscious of people your brain tells you more than your mouth can actually express mm -hmm. especially when it comes to taste and flavors yeah what are um, we tasting now yeah, what is this this now right <laughs> this is still a bourbon okay i so, thought good so, i got that much right okay so it's still a bourbon but what we do and this is a very traditional thing with single malt whiskeys is and not so much with bourbons is we take the bourbon already matured mm -hmm. we then put it in a sherry cask an emptied sherry cask barrel that we bring across from europe and it's got maybe 15 liters still sitting in the wood what happens over the first two to three weeks is especially in this climate where you've got huge swings in temperature swings in temperature swings in pressure it gets sucked into that carbon filter in the barrel really quickly and pushed out. That's why we're sitting in here. We can smell oh, yeah. the evaporation from the barrels. That's the angel shear. Yeah. So we put it in that barrel and very quickly all that sherry is now in the bourbon. But then what happens, which is really interesting, is for the next four or five months, we leave it in. And you now start getting influence from the European oak. So American oak, is uh, the grains are pretty tight mm -hmm. and it's brilliant for whiskey. European oak tends to be more for um, wines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they're a little wider in the grains. Right. And we end up getting a little bit more of a spiciness, a little bit more of a dark fruit. Right. But this is a, a sherry cask. Now, there are sherry casks releases in the US at Bourbon. But I think ours works because sherry is very used or wine is very used to clinging to malted barley. I don't think, and I can stand corrected here, but... I don't think it clings very well to the big heavy corns and the rise. Yeah. So now what we've got is a real sort of combination of that sherry, the malted barley, but it's still a bourbon because it's got 51 corn. Huh. It's delicious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would agree. Uh, this is a... Now, to me, this has more complexity to it than the bourbon we just had. There's more different layers, more, and I'm probably being probably gullible to suggestion, but I do get like more like kind of fruit tones in this, like, uh, and things like that. It just, as soon as we drank, as soon as we picked up, I was like, let's, it's very different than the other bourbon. It's very different because you've got that added complexity. You've got those added sort of dark fruits. Mm -hmm. You've got that wine. 
But what I didn't see is we've we've increased the proof from forty two to forty seven. Well, that, yeah. yeah, that's why you like it. No, yeah. uh, and and you know I think for this that's the sweet spot. I think raising the proof in some alcohol really makes a difference on the mouthfeel. Yeah, and I think this is significantly different. Yes, I oh, would agree. I think it's smoother, but it feels thicker too. Yeah, I was going to say it's a it's thicker mouthfeel. Crunchy feel. peanut yes. butter finish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. Nutella. I never want to think about peanut butter in my bourbon. You got my bourbon in your peanut butter. <laughs> wow, this is this is great. Mm-hmm. And once again, that flavor stays with you. It doesn't die. Mm-hmm. This more so, I think. Personally, I think more so. If I was picking up my bourbon versus this, I'd pick this up every time. Yeah. I, I enjoy anything that's finished in something, uh, whether it be sherry, port, Madeira. Which, which one? Which one are we drinking? Well, let, let, let's one. make sure we let our yeah, audience so. know exactly what this is because this is something. So this is the bourbon whiskey finished in sherry casks. Okay, so Boulder Spirits is an orange yeah. label. And how much does a bottle uh, uh, like that retail for? Uh, Fifty-five dollars. Great. Okay. So I mean, it's right in the Good deal. sweet spot. Yeah, that's great. So we've had the single malt, then we had the bourbon, then we had the bourbon. Um, we're going to have another bourbon now, all right? But there's a nice story behind this one. So this is the last of the bourbons. When I give you the single malt whiskey at the beginning, I just wanted you to get at that difference, that contrast. Yeah. So this one is our single... Oh, no, I picked up the wrong one, you see? Um, <laughs> That's what happens after three little tastings. In fact, I don't have that one with me. So the one I was going to give you, but I'm not, was our actually bottled in bond. Uh, now, yeah. it tells a great story. Bottled yeah, and Bond. Bottled and Bond, way back in 1897 and before, there was a lot of people were drinking straight from the still. The, the new make spirit, that was the norm. Yeah. Until somebody discovered that if you put bourbon in an oak barrel, it would actually taste better. <laughs> but as a direct result, there was lots of uh, dodgy characters that were dyeing it, uh, pretending it had been in a barrel, oh, putting yeah, sure, tobacco sure. spit and all sorts of yeah, things. Oh, yeah, yeah, so it really was undermining the whole barrel aging and really undermining what a lot of the great Kentucky guys were doing. So they had a, an act of Congress, 1897 bottled and bond act. And there was four main rules, single distillery, single season, 50 alcohol by volume. So they raised the alcohol content. Cause remember the minimum can be 40 ABV, mm-hmm. right. Ra- raised it to 50. But the most important part was it had to be in a barrel for a minimum of four years. Okay. So a bottled and bond bourbon is just a mark of quality. You know, you're going to get 50 ABV. It's coming from a single distillery, single season, but it's been in the barrel for four years. Ah. As opposed to straight whiskey, yeah. which is two years. Gotcha. Gotcha. So there's not many of us doing this. There's it's more many- expensive. It's more expensive for ads. I like it, and I don't want to compare it exactly, but if you drink a 12-year-old anything... It's right, it's ready. But if you drink an 18-year-old scotch, it's even better, but there's a little bit of a price increase. So, you know, with especially the climate in Colorado, we're losing so much in angel share. Oh, yeah. You know, that's how we we, we (laughs) warrant the price increase. But yes, so the bottle de Monde bourbon really is that sort of step up. And what it for us is really demonstrates where the progression of a bourbon can be and will be right so maybe when it's a little older it will be even better there'll be a mm. hell of a lot less of it but it'll be a little better yeah interesting fascinating i'm liking all of them yeah yeah so I far like I mean, i'm now going to flip back to single malt whiskey okay so we talked about the amount of liquid that actually sits in the barrel so what we do with our single malt whiskey is once it's fully matured we then bring it out and we put it in a, a port cask, okay. right? a ruby port. There's ruby, there's tawny, there's other ones, but they're yeah. the main two. So we put it in a, a ruby port barrel. We sit in it, exactly as I was saying earlier, for about six to eight months. And what we're trying to achieve here is something which, to be honest, it's not unique because single malt whiskey is very, very used. Malted barrel is very, very used to being in port barrels. Okay. But it just brings out that beautiful fortified wine flavor, a little bit more sweetness. And for me, it just really just, it just adds another layer to what I've already got. Some people say it takes away a couple of layers, but yeah, but the layer it gives is worth (laughs) that trade. Well, I see you have seven children on the table. Do you have a favorite child sitting Ah, here? 
We haven't tasted my two favourite yet. <laughs> oh my so we're, we're going to, we're going to I, I, when I do the tastings here. It's going to be a hell of a paper discussion, Brad. We did a... What paper? <laughs> we, do, we, do, we do four tastings. And uh, I always get asked, what's your favourite when we finish the tastings? And I said, none of those. Now, that's not to say that I don't wow. like them, but I want to give people tastings they for the contrast. They're all different, right? They, this the, is great. The final two are my personal favorite and and there's reasons why and i will come on this is just a single malt put into a port cask correct i have to tell you alistair if you go to other tasting you know if you just walk in and you were so generous to invite us in to do this but if you just go in and you walk into a distillery i would say that they have one that they try to highlight and the other ones it's like they make them just so that they have a compliment but they're really normally not that good. But to have, so far, four really good ones, oh I'm actually surprised. I thought you'd have like something that's great, cool. and then, you know, you know what I mean? I, I, I know, and, and as far as sales are concerned, yes, we do have our core. Sure. But you know, a lot of people like to, and oh. what's really fun is when I probably ask you what your favorites were, every one of you will be different, and you'll, mm. you'll, you'll, you'll pick up those expressions differently and you'll enjoy those expressions more than the other. And that's what's the fun thing about whiskies is it's not all just about a straight mm -hmm. bourbon or a straight single malt whiskey. It's all the varieties that you can then try. Right. So I would say up till now, three was my favorite until I had this because I think it finishes differently. I don't know how to explain it. It's a super clean finish. Yeah. Like it doesn't it doesn't linger as much with as many flavors, but it uh, I get more of the oak in this. Yeah, I, I'd, I I'd say these are really smooth though, Jeff. Well, yeah, of course they, they're all I mean, every wow. one of them has been great. So it's a little tough. Yeah, but uh, but they're also really different in character. Yep. Like I actually would like to believe I could I could pick them out. Yeah, like, you know I'm I between do. houses. I'm thinking about a place right upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I know you said you couldn't put it in words, but what makes this your favorite? I'm just curious. Like, what do you like about this? I, I, so I, you're usually I, I, a bourbon guy. I know, a, but I think that, so. Malt. So I, it reminds me of a bourbon, though. So I wouldn't okay. say that it's not. It's not far off, right? So I, there is a little bit of sweetness that I like. Yep. But I, 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 I love. It's a soft finish. It's more. Yes. It doesn't die. It just fades. You know, I like I agree hearing with that. bourbon drinkers saying that because here's the thing: our single malt whiskeys really lean to the flavors that Americans are used to. Because they're used to the new oak in all their spirit, in, in most of their whiskies, there are f really familiar pickups here. Mm -hmm. So it's the oakiness. It's this. It's a little bit more sweetness from that caramelization of the the sugars in a, in the oak. But for me, the sweetness from the, the the port is I can recognize, and most people can recognize, the difference between different sugars so they can know oh that's coming from, that sweetness has come from the port that's coming from the corn yeah. that's coming from sure the barrel and i think people are becoming very very aware of where their sugars it's sweet but it's a nice sweetness well why is it a nice sweetness because it's it's not coming from added sugar it's coming from the barrel or it's coming from the port right so it's layering it's it's layering and i think for, for me it is sweeter and i don't know if you've ever drunk port on its own because oh, yeah. i always well i always think of my grandmother when it, when yeah. i think of port and sherry yes. just little cups and yeah. Yep. Yeah, um, but it's it normally i would say oh that's that's too sweet but I, I i like it because i know the sweetness is coming from the port yeah this is really great and we're talking similar price points between the last two bottles yes we are our straight bourbon is at 45 and then the two that we're finishing at the end are $68, but then everything else is 55 So Sorry. if you're looking for this one, it's, uh, again, Boulder Spirits, American Single Malt Whiskey, and then it just says on the bottom, Port Cask. I mean... And for I, 45 bucks, Jeff, that's a deal. Oh, yeah. That's, that's a steal, actually. Uh, it's, when you said soft, that actually resonated a lot with me with this one. It's very, very... And that, the other ones haven't been smooth, but this one just is like, it, it's almost like it evaporates off your tongue or something. Right. But, I don't it, know. but it lasts longer too. Well, yeah, the flavor right? stays, yeah. but it's it's really, the mouthfeel is really what stands Joel, out. Joel, what do you think? I do love it. I'm not a big single malt guy, but this is very... Yeah, it's it's different. Drinkable. Yes. As yeah. we Americans like this. And, and, that, and I think part <laughs> of that is it just, as I said, leans towards that new, new oak barrel. Mm. And, you know, what we do here at the distillery, you know, since COVID... We used to have a, a tasting bar where people came in and bought cocktails. We shut that down uh, when COVID started and we haven't actually reopened. But what we do, and we, we love this part of it, is that we are open from 12 to 6, seven days a week. You can book tours online, but the 12 to 6 is people just wandering. Uh, if they want to taste anything we have, we'll pour them a taster. 
and it just gives them an understanding of what we've got because you know one of the things craft spirits really struggles with is people like consistency and want to know like to stick to what they know and to spend money on a bottle of whiskey at 50 60 dollars is a big commitment yeah. so by tasting and covid we weren't able to do that craft distillers weren't able to do that so what we now do is we have a lot of people come in and say hey you know i don't know what i like can you give me a couple pours of they're not that big a pours but they're pours <laughs> you know and we spend time with them say this is what the difference between that what do you normally like and it allows us to really sort of focus on what they, they like and what they don't like and they are happier then to spend that money on it if we're able to do that and a lot of our distilleries and a lot of the craft distilleries are doing that now uh -oh. This is an interesting. One. Wow, so, I, the tone changed, didn't it? We got serious here. I, uh, we're still not. <laughs> oh we're still. We're still not in the final two. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're still not in the final two. Okay. So, in in Europe, you tend to find that there's there's lots of peated single malt whiskey, yeah. from very low peat to very high. In the US, I think a lot of people's first introduction to peated single malt whiskey is something like an Isla, which is like a Lafroy, a Bovini, which is in measurement terms, 40, 50 phenols per million, i.e. Yeah. Uh, right? PPM phenols per million. It's a bit off the chart. It's chewy, it's dirt, it's medicinal, it's all those <laughs> things. So I got a lot of people coming in here. I hate peated single malt whiskey. Oh, really? And I think because, you know, Lafroig is number one in the U.S. by a long way. Yeah, I mean, it's like drinking a glass of smoke. You're right. I mean, and I love it. But, uh -huh. I, I, I'm, but I'm actually one of those other people. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I do not like really peaty drinks. I oh, don't I love and, it. And, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm the same. Uh, maybe the last drink at night, but that's about it. So what I wanted to do was do something which was, was subtle and it was expression. Mm. So even although this is absolutely there on the nose and at the end, and you'll be chewing it for another five, ten minutes, Perfect. it's still... <laughs> down it and hey this is our best guess 15 phenols per million yeah it's not a ickle of four okay no. it's not like you're you know i could smell that from a foot away if that's what we were drinking <laughs> yeah. this, this like oh no there are it's, drinks it's, it's there right? there are it drinks is, that you rinse your glass on. with some of those really peaty ones and then pour everything else in and, and make a, a cocktail just for that oh. kind of that base or that yeah i definitely get the talisker do you know yep. you're spawned because talisker is very you're right talisker is a very light yep a peaty single malt whiskey Probably similar to this as far as the phenol counts concerned, mm -hmm. but not all of Freud. I was out with a chap a couple of weeks ago, and he worked for uh, a distillery. He's an American, but he worked for Bruchladi, and they do what's called the Oxymor, Octomore, and they got up to three hundred nine phenols per minute. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Might as well just go eat some peat. Exactly. Right. Well, this is this is the thing. This is like for. I mean, this is the thing that happens with alcoholic beverages a lot. There becomes this like escalation thing. We were talking earlier, or I was talking earlier about um, hazy IPAs. Right. It's the same thing in the craft brewing industry. It's gotten to the point now where people are making beers that are so hoppy, it actually physically is painful to drink them. Like it hurts your throat. Like right. the acids and the hops are too much. But that's the thing. That's what people are. I mean, it's just kind of a macho thing, I guess. I, I'm silly. I, I don't know. Yeah. This is fantastic. I think though. the blend is great too. And I'm not a peat person. Yeah, this isn't overpowering to you. Like this Correct. isn't like see. I, no, but some of those that if I smell the peat here, I, I pretty much can't drink it. See, I like that, but but this is I like this a lot too. And and mm. I could not do this. I had to do a peated single malt whiskey. I had to do it. Yeah. Now I'm curious. Does this, does this sell obligated. particularly better than your non-peated uh, versions? Do people pick up on that, or they even? When we do tastings here, we sell more peated single malt whiskey than any other. Right. Because people just from the distillery. It's got that. I mean, if you. If you've ever had any interest in Scotch whiskey at all, yeah, this is the flavor you're like. I may not know much, but I know what that is exactly. right because I mean you'd have to like uh, you'd have to be brain dead to not be able. To yeah. <laughs> okay, that's smoky alcohol. Yep, yeah, that's but it. It's, it. To me, it's a it's a very sort of familiar uh, yeah. smell and taste. I don't like any alcohol that's been smoked in something like, like a mezcal. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, or or cocktails that they you know they put the smoke thing over. Yeah, yeah have you ever had a, uh, a German rock beer? No. It's like a smoke. They smoke the malts. Uh, really? It's not peat. It's some other. But it's a very smoky flavor. Oh yeah, it's like a smoky uh, dark beer. It's it's not really particularly pleasant, but you know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're a beer nerd. You it's like it's, it's like going out to dinner with someone and they say, you know what, this tastes like shit. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, I, I, is this milk spoiled? <laughs> maybe ages here but we had two elderly women in here the other day and they must have been in their late 70s i never asked 
<laughs> and uh, oh, one of them was a big whiskey drinker the other one had never tasted whiskey in her life and she went through our whiskeys and she literally spat the first one out spat the second one out spat the third one out and fell in love with the peated single malt and said you've given me a new lease of life she said i will now be buying you know peated single malt whiskey for the rest of my life oh really it was and, like her uh, introduction to it Man, this is so nice. I'm like, uh, I, I'm starting to agree with you. What paper? Uh, let's just talk about whiskey for the yeah, next right. Well, we've got we've got two more to go. Okay, so yeah, we've got two. Oh no, we've got two more to go. Use use a little bit of water to wash that out. Otherwise, okay. you're going to get. Oh yeah, sure. You're going to get peat in everything else you drink from. Yeah, there you were on. saying there were some cocktails you had where people just put the uh, really highly peated yeah. whiskey and shake it up around the glass, yeah. and dump it out, but that <laughs> residue is left there for that. Oh yeah, kind sure. of that smoky aura. Oh yeah, right. yeah, yeah, and it definitely. You know, we, we've got to really clean the pipes when we're doing the bottling. If we've done oh, peated, yeah. we have to oh, scrub them exactly. because yeah. it, it carries through. Yeah. So the last two we're going to taste tonight is again going back to the single malt whiskies. Personally, these are my favorite, but everybody has their own, their own thoughts. So we did a single malt whiskey with a port finish. And again, pretty traditionally, single malt whiskies are finished in sherry okay. as well as port. So sherry, if you can, again, my grandmother's drink again, port and sherry. <laughs> it is very, very different to, okay. to the port. I don't think it's as sweet, but I think it's got a lot more different flavors to it. So we do exactly the same. We get our matured single malt whiskey, and then we finish it in an Ol Rosso sherry barrel or PX uh, sherry barrel. Now, those sherry barrels are coming across from uh, in Europe. You know, we got to know the history of them, where they're coming from. But here's the thing. I mean, the Scotch whiskey industry demands so many of these barrels for finishing whiskey that port and sherry can't keep up. So the big port and sherry producers literally leave it in the barrel, they condition the barrel, and then they dump it down the drain because oh <laughs> there's more demand for the barrels. And they're three or four <laughs> times more funny. expensive than brand new barrels. Yeah. Oh, yeah. they got to get their money somewhere. They're extortionally expensive. So I just love... This is the same whiskey exactly the same that whiskey. we had here that was done in a port cask, mm -hmm. but now we're going to have it from a sherry cask. Correct. Okay. I was just trying to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've so, had a lot so of whiskey. So pretty much you'll, you'll, yeah, like, you'll do a batch and half goes one way and half goes the other way? Yeah, once we've fully matured. So for example, there's six sherry barrels coming in, 250 liters uh, sherry barrels coming in in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So we'll take fully matured single malt whiskey out of the barrels, pour them into the new barrels, and then wait for six to eight months. Hmm. So, this is my one of my favorites. Whoa, that's good. Yeah. Nothing's been bad, right? That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Nothing's been bad. I mean, bottom line is, if you close your eyes and just pick one, you're doing okay. Yes. Yeah. No. I mean, that was the thing. We walked in here today. I was like, wow. I was looking at the, the bottles. I was just like, wow. They do a lot of different whiskey variations. Right. That's not something you usually see at a craft distillery, as you were saying earlier. I mean, it's more expressions. I mean, we just do we do a single malt and a bourbon. But, but everything else in expression or a bottled and bond. Sure. And, you know, we don't actually, this one that you're tasting is actually not being distributed. This hmm. is just from the distillery because we were sort of te not testing the market, but we were seeing what it came out like because nobody yeah, else has sure. done this. Sure. So we're seeing how it came out from that, that new oak barrel and then the finishing. And I think we're now laying down three sherry barrels that mm. will maybe come out. Maybe Christmas will put this on. But most of our products, nobody else is really doing one or two people. So I've got to be careful how many skews I bring out. Yeah, right. Yeah, get, yeah, yeah, it can no. get confusing too. It can get confusing. You're absolutely right. Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, say, so this one, I get similar things to what we had in the port, except for it's like a lighter fruit. Totally agree. Like a little bit. Like, oh my God, I sound like a wine snob. But I mean, but I, I, I don't like that. But I mean, it does have like kind of an apple pear like thing going on to me, like in the in the high end, like on the front of the tongue, you kind of get that. I definitely taste more sherry in this than I tasted port in this for me. I get I get the sherry flavor here. You know like, what? Uh, it's just good. <laughs> I, um, yeah. I agree. I mean, of course. But, but I, I don't know how to explain it other yeah, than all right, just, just, just get one, experience well, it yourself. You know, when we taste 10 single malt whiskey barrels or bourbon barrels, we have a sort of almost eight of them will be spot on. One will be not that great. And we sort of just let it age more. Yeah. One barrel will be spectacular for whatever reason. Yeah. And we, we maybe do that as a distillery release or a single barrel. But interestingly, when we tasted about five of these barrels together, 
every single one was distinctly different. Really? So we ended up blending three of them, putting two back, and now we're getting the two, maybe one will be okay. Hmm. Uh, when I say okay, you know, age, age does remedy a lot of things. Sure. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the sherry and port have been a little bit more inconsistent between barrels. Oh, interesting. So, so tell us about the process. Like, so you're, you're getting ready to think about bottling some of the barrels mm-hmm. you've laid down. You guys go through and you do you taste each barrel? Do you have other people come in that you trust their opinion? Is it just employees? Like, how do you say like, okay, so this barrel's good. I mean, I know you can make your own judgments, but, mm-hmm. but as you said, everybody tastes things differently. So, you know, you can't just make your own judgment unless you're... We, we've got some good staff people here. Good employees who are really good at tasting. It's a tough part of the job, but they they, they step up to it. And then we we have sort of guest appearances. We (laughs) set or know when we're going to be tasting. And we all make our own opinions. And it literally is not not shouting out peanut butter, but we're moving (laughs) things forward and deciding ourselves and (laughs) writing it down. Yeah, but you guys, you're experienced. Where does the customer come into this? You would be shocked at how close most people would get to what we are selecting. Really? You would be shocked. And the reason I say that is because we've had people who couldn't express anything verbally yeah. about what they've tasted, but, but no, just they, they, their brain were saying, that's better, that's better, that's better. And we've had whiskey clubs in here doing the exact same, and we know which bars we like, and then they pick that out. And that's cool. So you get confirmation. Person. It's confirmation, but also your brain tells you. It's just incredible. And what I normally do, I do an extra step. When I do 10, say 10 single malt whiskeys, I get our standard single malt whiskey and I use that just to sort of wet the palate to know what I'm, level, I'm expecting. Level, yeah, 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 level right, playing right, field. Right. But I'm always astounded at how much they're different, mm. but also how people on a consensus always get together on mm. those are the eight. And if we were really arguing about it, we might just blend seven, throw the other ones back, let them age a bit more and then revisit it at a later date. Brad, when your son gets married, we need to come in, we need to taste these whiskeys, we need to choose a barrel, and we need to choose two, get them to blend together, make it the creative distillation barrel. That's Crazy. unbelievable. That's a great idea. And he is a whiskey lover. Yeah, there you go. Lover. And then we can sell it to our, our, our <laughs> literally... Sell it? Literally no, 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 no. <laughs> ten dozens of fans out there that are listening to this podcast. And I, I, did, I did the two the 50 ml bottles for my brother-in-law's is like uh, do you have what's called favors do you know what they are i don't know what that is weddings where where the bride yeah. and groom gives something away. oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. like party favors yeah. and uh so i made something like 300 of the two yeah. two inch bottles with cool. their a picture of them on it yeah, that's cool <laughs> ah, for my wedding ideas. we brewed all the beer and we made uh one keg of mead and uh, it was a sweet mead and it was summer in tennessee and people didn't realize that mead is like you know 10 13 percent i don't actually know what the percentage was on this one Higher really, than they thought. It was really popular. And uh, <laughs> the bluegrass band sounded a lot better to people. And uh, my dad was doing donuts on his Harley in the parking lot. It was, <laughs> it was, quite, a, you know, it was a, quite a redneck event. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, this is, this is just fantastic, great. Alistair. Thank you so much. So the last one we have here, again, is probably my equal favorite. So we talked about Bottled and Bond. And it just really demonstrated the development of where American single malt whiskey is going. And our single malt whiskey was ready three years, called a straight whiskey. This, we had to actually even say straight whiskey again, but this is the bottled and bond. So it's a little bit, not much higher proof, but it's about four and a quarter years. So okay. two extra summers. And that two extra summers makes a big difference. Mm. Really hot summers really yeah, evaporate. Yeah, here this, in Colorado, I mean, the summer this, is yeah. like oh, a serious yeah, yeah. event. And so it shows you, and as I said earlier on about single malt whiskey, you know, Scotch whiskey, a 12-year-old is ready, an 18-year-old is better. This is exactly the same here. And it just also sort of shows you that development of where the spirit's going. Now, uh, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but there's not many people in the U.S. that have put malted barley in New York barrels at this climate for this long. Yeah. So there is a little bit of a danger where that barley eventually could get overtaken by the new bar. Oh, interesting. So I've had Mm. single malt whiskey, climate similar to this, that's 10 years old. And it was just too much, too okay, too tanniny, licking leather. So you have to find somewhere in that curve before it, It, right? Exactly. And I think we're in a good position in as much as we've got a still that will make heavier whiskey. But I don't think most of this whiskey won't last 
as far as sales is concerned, beyond eight years, and I think where's going to be the sweet spot for American single malt whiskey in this climate. Now, explain that. What do you mean that it won't last beyond eight years? Well, it might just get too leathery. So that oh. oakiness literally overtakes the malted barley. Okay. So at the moment, to a Scotch whiskey drinker, this is sweet and oaky. Oh. Then it just could get too sweet. Well, not so much too sweet, but too oaky. Yeah. So the tannins you know, overtake. Too much tannin. So yeah. eight years we'll be sold out with everything we've got and that's probably going to be the sweet spot where we're going to be sitting eight years old so this is just under five and a half years old where it's going to go in a year's time who knows there's very few people in the whole of the u.s that have done it at this 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 age um oh, this is my favorite <laughs> it might just be you telling me that's your uh, favorite <laughs> peanut butter no but i mean yeah. there's so much more oh. complexity and depth to this than the ones that we've tasted there's just multiple layers of like, you know, you get the caramel a little bit, and then you get a little bit of heat and a little bit of smoke, a little bit of char. It's it's just a more complex beverage, in my opinion. I agree with you. And for me, you take a sip and count to two minutes and it's still, <laughs> yeah. it's still yeah. there. Yeah, you're going to do a crossword puzzle. I just took yeah. a drink of water in the <laughs> flavor. <laughs> that's impressive, man. And I, I don't know, you know, I've had a few commentaries about this where – even the jump up in proof, yeah. for a lot of whiskey drinkers, that jump up in proof gives them a better mouthfeel. Yeah. And even though those are only jumping up from 46 to 50, yeah. I think it makes a little bit of a difference as well. Yeah, so this is the highest proof one we've had, right? This is 50. Um, there's no yeah. Ones, yeah. Okay, so these, this is why I are, like it. <laughs> you know, these are, these are great. They're great. No, this one, this one though, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, they've all been really good, and I've enjoyed them all. This one has a, a depth to it that is different. I think you're right. I think this is hitting the sweet spot. And I assume that this is a more expensive bottle if you want to go buy. Yeah, it. that's jumping yeah. up to sixty eight dollars. It would have to be because it, yeah, you got another time. year. Yeah. You're sitting in the warehouse. Well, so. when we're losing, you know, five six percent yeah. anyway a year, and our two years really. So makes bolded difference. spirits, bottled in bond, that's my favorite. You got a favorite, Brad? Come I on, have, I have two favorites actually. Two favorites. Nice. So I think that there are different ways to go, and I think that I, I'm planning my evening, right? Yeah, so, this would be so, our last one. So I would say number four and the last one are my what two was favorites. Number four oh, was the sherry cask. Yes. Yeah, really, I like the port cask better. I think. Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, but yeah. I'm gonna have to try them again. But now I'm gonna start to lose it a little bit. So no, I think yeah, you don't be another another, another time. <laughs> but I, I, it was it was three or four and and the last one because I really did like. It was even close to syrupy, just on the edge. And I did like that feel. And truthfully, I drink my whiskeys with two ice cubes. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, and we're drinking this without ice cubes. Yeah. So I just don't know how that would open these up. I actually think we have to come back with ice next time. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> or just get a bottle. Yeah. A, a bottle. <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> the higher proof ones open up spectacularly. I think when you get to the lower proof bourbon, you're right at that point where a little bit of water, the rest of them can take a bit more yeah. if you want to add water. But I, I always, when I do tastings, ask people to add water to the first one because, again, I want to see people understand when you add mm. water, actually yeah. changes the nose, changes the flavor. Yeah. But add too much and you're, oh, no, you're you can kill thinning it, it down. Yeah. Right. So people always ask me what do I like in my whiskey. I say a really hard ice cube. Yep. Yeah. An ice cube that will keep it cool, but also melt at such a slow rate. That's right. That it's only melted a very small amount when you finish your whiskey. Yeah. Right. Uh, and it does just change that whole thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I still smell peat for my last one. Ah. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's affecting me, truthfully. I don't know if the complexity has a smokiness to it. I don't. Some people mistake char for Maybe that that's peatiness. Why. But there's definitely a little bit more char in this one. I get one. the char. That's, that's and that's exactly the char. right. Oh, that's right. You've got to be familiar with peat to know the, the slight yeah. difference. No, it's not peat. I mean, that's a different thing than just the, the this. Like, yeah, I think you're right. This is the char for sure. Yep. Now, I might get stand corrected, but, you know, I think whiskey is one of the, 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 the spirits that really does evoke memories, who you're with, mm. what you were doing with them. Correct. Absolutely. All those kind of things. and. I think, you know, I've told people who are really into, into tequila that it's the same. I don't know. But I think whiskeys really evoke that kind of memories. And, you know, I've got memories. If I think of any one of those, I other than the bourbons, but I have some great <laughs> memories. <laughs> well, it's, I'm well, new, you I'm your new grandmother. I'm new to it. <laughs> so it invokes a lot of great memories for me and people who I would drink certain, you know, sherry or pour or, or especially um, peated with. And, and that's part of the joy of whiskey. So I guess the bottom line is, if you don't like the person you're drinking with, 
Take him to a different place. Uh, <laughs> it's like naming your or, kid after somebody that you don't like. Right. You know, you have bad experience with that person. Hey, I'll start. This has been awesome. Absolutely. Well, listen, guys, I'll let you get on with what you're getting on right now. <laughs> we're not going on. <laughs> well, I thought you were going on. How long have we been going? Oh, we've been going like about an hour. Yeah, so... So we so normally have 45 so, minutes total. Yeah. All right. So at this point, we've tasted seven Six. wonderful whiskeys. I, I don't even really have to ask this question. Well, Brad, Brad would, you, would you like to sample your favorite again, or would you like to talk about a paper? My favorite is definitely the way to go. By the way, after having seven <laughs> different tastings here... What paper? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a little, right. t- a little tough. And I feel like we deserve a break. I mean, we, know, we've done how many episodes, Joel? Like, I can't count. This is number 20. Oh, I love it. I love it. So number 20 <laughs> episode of Creative Distillation. We can label this uh, what paper. Yeah. Here's the other thing though, that, that's really cool is that Alistair's a really good guy. And oh, we, well, we, yeah. We would not oh, have spent this much time <laughs> we talking spent this about... much time with any guest. No. Um, I don't spend this much time with my family. <laughs> 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 but I just say that this has been a great discussion, but Alistair, this, this it's a great question, though. What about entrepreneurial? I mean, coming in, starting in a new business, lessons learned, mistakes you made. Well, we um, have so many students who are really passionate about craft brewing or distilling or, or just any craft thing. Because I think your story is really interesting. You're like, well, you know, I, I needed to do something I cared about. I needed a hobby. And Second hobby career. Business. But yeah. for a lot of our students, they don't have that option. But they want to go straight. They want to sort of skip the first step and just go straight into their, their sort of passion. And, and you've done that. Any insights you have from having done this, like that I think you share got, with them? I think if you're going to make your passion your business, I think you have to have done something before that. Yeah. I think it's essential that you build up the skills yep. before you go into your passion. Mm-hmm. And even then, you know, the skills that I got from being in a business, running a business for 15 years, yes, a lot of them are transferable, but a lot of them are not. Yeah. But the good thing is, even though I had the lack of knowledge, I just was one of the guys that asked a lot of questions. And sometimes coming from a different industry with a different perspective really has an added benefit as long as you're prepared to make mistakes, fail at a few of the decisions. But that's all part of running a business. So, yeah, you know, I absolutely. failed as many times as other people, but succeeded as well as other people. So I still ask a lot of dumb questions and uh, just try and build up my knowledge in what I'm doing. Yeah. But well, I would say the other thing that's really interesting here, though, you could sell finance. If you had raised money and had partners pressuring you one way or the other, things may have turned out differently. Yes, because I'm a 100% owner. I could make the, all the decisions myself. But even that, you know, there comes a time, especially if you're selling whiskey, that is a four or five year horizon. You know, what you make today is not going to be enough yeah. to supply your customers Correct. in five years right, right. if your business plan is X, Y, and Z growth. Yeah. So there comes a time where most, especially whiskey distilleries, really have that to try and either have to bring other investors in yeah. or they get bought out by the big guys yeah. or VCs come in. Right. I mean, personally, I will go on as long as I can. Right. Uh, but, you know, if this is successful... The flip side is that you have to have the money for laying down barrels today for five years growth. Yeah. And that right. is incredibly, That's, well, it's impossible. Yeah. It's impossible to anticipate where you're Yeah, I mean, your cash flow just can't bear that a lot of the times. Right. Yeah, yeah, just, absolutely. How can, how can you do that? Absolutely. You know, it reminds me of an insight from a paper I wanted to talk about. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. You know, uh, so uh, the cool thing is, though, coming out of COVID, um, being no, locked I down, to say that too, th- th- this was perfect, right? No, just no, to, seriously, to go out and like, have a couple drinks yeah. to really promote this business. And I'm not promoting this because I have to. Anybody that's listening, <laughs> trust me, as much as you can trust a voice in your headset, these whiskeys are great. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, like that, that is so true. I mean, to me, this uh, episode of the podcast has been about going out and talking to someone who uh, spending more time with an entrepreneur and less time in the papers and just the beauty of, of, of someone taking something that comes from their, their heritage, their knowledge, who they are, and then turning it into a product we can all enjoy. Yep. Uh, Boulder spirits. These are amazing whiskeys. Yep. If totally you like agree. whiskey and bourbon, you got to come here. And, uh, and if, if you can't come here, then you need to find these on your, on your local shelves. And if you can't do that, then you need to ask for them because <laughs> They are fantastic. Alistair, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and with your whiskey. I think Brad and I took more than the angel's share, but we're very happy to have done Uh, so. Oh, yeah. Thanks, guys. No, really enjoyed that. Thanks. It's just been wonderful. So once again, this is Creative 
Distillation, where we distill uh, entrepreneurial research and actual insights and sometimes just drink whiskey. Uh, my name is Jeff York. I'm the research director at the Deming Center for Entrepreneurship, joined by my co-host. I'm Brad Warner. And by the way, just check out the Deming Center at the Leeds School of Business online. Um, it's a really cool place. Amazing people very open-minded. We're pushing the boundaries and uh, hopefully we continue to do so. And we got a new building we're moving into. It's uh, it's literally a bridge between business and engineering at the University of Colorado, which we're extremely excited about. Once again, this was uh, hosted by Boulder Spirits. Uh, You can find them online. Uh, Come on out and visit. They're at the Vapor Distillery here in Boulder. And uh, man, I just, uh, this has just been wonderful to get out and spend time and uh, do something we haven't been able to do in a year and a half. Thanks a lot, guys. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time.